What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Be like everybody else. Hit that subscribe button now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another mafia topic. And one of the more fascinating stories in the history of the mob are the random ones, the ones that jump out at you, ones that are created into movies or books. Today, we're going to talk about a kamikaze couple who were labeled Bonnie and Clyde, two individuals from different backgrounds, but similar backgrounds that were down on their luck and decided that robbing mob social clubs might be a good way for a quick windfall. The story of Thomas and Rosemary Uva next on Sit Down Shorts. Uh, the Uvas were married in 1987. Rosemary was born in 1961, and she would come up in the Italian enclave of Ozone Park, Queens. It was said that she was from a very Italian family. And as a child, sadly, her father would die very early in her life, really in her teens. And according to her mother, she would become a wild child after that. In the early 80s, she would be arrested for attempted robbery and get 15 months in state prison. Before that, though, she had met a young Italian whippersnapper named Thomas Uva. Now, Thomas Uva was actually from Throg's Neck in the Bronx. His father owned a flower shop uh, and was said to be very well known in the neighborhood. Now, in both neighborhoods, as we know, the mob was in both strongholds in Throg's Neck and in Ozone Park. Uh, but Thomas Uva's father was a straight-laced businessman who owned this floral shop. Sadly, though, Thomas Uva, like his uh, soon-to-be wife, would face strife as well. His father would die as well. So they had that in common. Very sad. Thomas Uva's father would actually, while cleaning a gun, shoot himself in the leg uh, and hit an artery and die. It was a very sad uh, accident. And sadly enough, uh, Uva kind of went off the deep end as well. It would be further uh, sad for Uva because the flower shop that his father owned was actually given to his brother, Uva descended into a sad and dark depression where it was said that he began experimenting with narcotics. Now, um, he would also go to prison for robbery as well. They would both hit prison and really kind of say their goodbyes. But once they were released in the late 80s, as I said, they would be married. Now, Rosemary Uva would get a straight laced job at a collection agency. She would begin her ascent into the workforce again and try to maintain a normal job. For most, ex-criminals, that is not easy. And for most drug addicts, it's not easy. Now, she would get her, her new husband, Thomas, a job as well. And there was an interesting thing that developed between both Rosemary and Thomas Uva. According to an individual named Michael Schusel, who was the boss of the two at the collection agency, he would discuss that Tom Uva was in, in very interested in the mafia. And in fact, he would ask for days off and according to Uva, he was going to go to the trial of the dapper Don John Gotti. He was very into the mob. They had an interest in the mob. And remember, mo both of them had grown up in mob areas, especially Rosemary, who uh, was from Ozone Park. We know how much of a stronghold that area is. So they had that interesting proclivity. And this is where they decide that, you know what? The straight life ain't for us. We can't get by doing what we're doing. This just ain't us. We're criminals at the end of the day. So Thomas Uva hatches a wild yet somewhat smart plan. He realizes quickly that the mob runs their business for the most part uh, through social clubs. We all know about the social clubs, right? The Ravenite, the Wimpy Boys, the Veteran Friends. We've heard about all of them, the, whole, you know, the 19th hole, all these different social clubs. Uva realizes a couple of three things. He realizes, one, that uh, mob social clubs don't have guns in them. There's a strict rule in social clubs, no guns. Uh, number two, they ain't going to call the cops. It's like robbing drug dealers. What are they going to call the cops and say, hey, we're in a mob social club and we just got robbed? They don't call the cops. We know that. Third, 
What do we know about mobsters? Gaudy people. They always have the pinky rings and the necklaces and the bracelets and big wads of cash in their uh, pockets with the rubber bands around them, right? So it was a win-win-win for the Uvas. Now, the drawback was it was a kamikaze mission. You're beginning to rob clubs where known felons and killers hang. Eventually, they're going to come back on you. But as we know, when you're young, in your 20s, uh, in late or early 30s, you do things that maybe you shouldn't do because you feel, you know, powerful and nothing's ever going to happen bad to you. Now, they would put this plan into motion and Rosemary would act as the driver. Uva would walk into the social club with his Uzi machine gun and uh, Halloween bag, if you will. Didn't have a mask on, was very out in the open, held no punches there. Now, this would all start in 1992, and the first club they would hit uh, was a club belonging to Gambino heavyweight uh, Joe Butch Correo, seen here. Uh, Joe Butch ran the Hawaiian Moonlighter Social Club in Manhattan. It was at uh, 141 Mulberry Street between Hester and uh, Grand. This was very close to the Ravenite Social Club. And as we know, the Ravenite would go away in the early 90s, uh, and it would be seized by the government. The Mulberry a club of the Hawaiian Moonlighters would act as kind of a new haunt uh, for Gambino family people. And keep in mind, they had been going there because it had been run by Joe Butch as well. They would hit that club and make off with an unknown amount of cash. Also hit uh, was a club belonging to Gambino powerhouse Jimmy Brown Failure, the Veteran Friends Social Club. As we know, that was the same haunt that outside in 1986, Frankie DeChico would be killed in a car bombing. Now, also hit were other families' clubs, including a club run by Anthony Old Man Spiro called the West End uh, Social Club. That was in uh, Bath Beach. We obviously know about uh, Anthony Spiro. Also hit was a club belonging to Georgie DeChico. That was also in the Benson Earth Bath Beach Avenue. So they're starting to hit a lot of clubs. And they're not just hitting Gambino clubs. They're hitting Bonanno family clubs as well. Now, one of the people that would take the brunt of this assault was this individual. And you know him because we did a video on Skinny Don Pazonia pretty recently. He would have a major problem with the couple, uh, Bonnie and Clyde. He would be not hit once, but twice. And his club uh, was a place called the Cafe Liberty Social Club. Now, the Cafe Liberty for a long time was run by Gambino heavyweight Anthony Fat Andy Ruggiano. Now, once Ruggiano goes away, Pazonia takes it over and becomes a higher up. Now, the Cafe Liberty was one that, according to people, Uva and his wife enjoyed hitting. They ended up hitting it twice, as I said. Now, in one instance, it was rumored that once Uva made it into the club, he started getting very brazen with his behavior. He started at one point uh, messing with the hair of an elder individual inside the club, which is a no-no in mob circles. It's a no-no to touch a mobster in general, but it is an incredible no-no to touch the hair of an individual. Also, in one of the clubs, it was rumored that one of the mobsters would actually tell Thomas Uva, you know we're going to get you sometime, right? Uva would respond with, quote, everybody dies. So the clear indication of Uva was... His life to him was worthless. He didn't care anymore about dying. He was going to do what he had to do in the name of money. And that's really the descent. They descended into this worthless attitude where they just didn't care about their lives anymore. And they became uh, uh, addicted to the money, uh, an addicted personality. They were addicted to the money. And that became their drug of choice. Um, now, ultimately, this would all shake out because – in one of the late stages of the robbery uh, cycle, mobsters would actually go after the car uh, that they were in, and they would catch the license plate. And again, they would use through connections that they had to figure out that Rosemary and Thomas Uva were the main culprits. Now, keep in mind, they lived in the neighborhoods they were robbing people in. They were living very much out in the open, and that was not a particularly good idea. Uh, if you're going to rob places... The old adage is you don't shit where you eat, as we all know. You never get high on your own supply, all those different rules. But one of the rules is 
you don't shit where you eat. And it's a pretty brazen thing to rob mob social clubs and then go back and live in those areas. If you're going to rob mob social clubs in Ozone Park and Bensonhurst and Manhattan, live out in Jersey or Long Island or somewhere like that where, you know, you're not going to turn up, especially with no mask on. Now, as I said, Dom Pazonia was most pissed off. But by this point, the Bonanno and Gambino of crime families had an open contract on these two. Now, according to uh, mob rap Mikey Scars D. Leonardo, he would testify in a trial in the 90s that Pazonia was visibly annoyed and pissed off about this. And he would go to boss of the family at the time, John Jr. Gotti. And according to D. Leonardo, Gotti... You know, he was kind of told by Pizzonia, look, uh, when I find these fucks, I'm killing them. It's that simple. Fast forward to December 24th, 1992. Uh, the Rob the Mob couple would be stalked to an intersection at Woodhaven Boulevard and East 103rd uh, Avenue. Uh, at that point, Dom Pizzonia and um, Gambino enforcer uh, Ronnie one Arm Truccio would stalk the couple and kill them at the scene. On Christmas Eve, 1992, they would die, Rosemary and Thomas Uva, uh, for their behavior. You have to admit, at some point, it was going to happen. And they met the end of something they assumed would happen. You can't continue to do this. They got so brazen. They got so out of control that eventually they didn't just take their money and run. They became addicted to it, and they just robbed one too many. Uh, it was just that simple. It was a kamikaze mission, quite simply. Now, this would be interesting because ultimately, as I said in a previous video, Dom Pazonia and Ronnie Onearm would both uh, see a jury on this. They would go to trial for this murder, among others, and ultimately were not convicted of this. They beat the rap uh, as well. Keep in mind, the federal government had some big time witnesses, including Mikey Scars D. Leonardo, Bonanno, uh, Underboss. Uh, Salvatore Vital. There was a lot of corroboration to this, but they were never found guilty. Now, Dom Bazonia had a very interesting alibi. As many of us know, Dom Bazonia was an accomplished cook in the Gambino crime family. He would say uh, that he could not have done this crime because on December 24th, as a great Italian and a great cook, he was uh, uh, whipping up the famous Seven Fishes dinners. There was no way he could have done this. It was a pretty good alibi quite frankly. Uh, whether that beat the rap for him, we don't know. But it definitely may have checked out because we know Don Bazonia was a very good cook. Shout out to his lawyer uh, for that one. Now, this would be an interesting problem, though, for the Bonanno crime family as well. Um, the big issue that uh, Joey Messino would have is that there was an open contract, as we know. Uh, and this was a great way for some people uh, to kind of do what they do and flex their muscles. Uh, Joey Messino would be told by Patrick Patty from the Bronx, De Filippo, who was a cop of regime. He was told by De Filippo that two people in his crew, uh, Vinnie Gorgias Abasciano and Anthony Donato, they would tell De Filippo that they did this piece of work. And Messino was fed this by De Filippo. Now, ultimately, in a sit-down, Messino would find out that wasn't true. Now, this would be, you would think, a problem for Donato and Basciano. For whatever reason, Messino never does anything about this. He basically scolds Di Filippo uh, for telling him a lie. Di Filippo would ultimately admit, according to the great book, uh, Vinnie Gorgeous by Anthony Di Stefano, he would tell Messino that, indeed, it probably wasn't true and that he fed him a falsehood. Now, uh, why nothing would ever happen, I don't know. Uh, but Vinnie Gorgeous would just elevate, as we know, in that family. But ultimately, a very interesting story. We knew and we know reading back about the Rob the Mob couple that this was likely the end for them. I will say this. One of the great movies of the last 10 or 15 years in the mob genre is a film called The Wannabe, starring Vincent Piazza and Patrick Patricia Arquette. Marco Imperioli is in it as well. And it's directed and executive produced, as you see, by... Martin Scorsese. This is, I think, one of the best mob movies nobody talks about. It is very factual, too. They do a great job. You know, some of it is is obviously bent up for, for Hollywood, but uh, Vincent Piazza does a terrific job in this film. Uh, I think one of the best mob movies of the last 
10 or 15 years. Very underrated. So make sure you go check that out. There's also a movie uh, starring Michael Plitt. Um, he was in Boardwalk Empire. Uh, I don't think it's as good as The Wannabe, but two good movies if you're looking for one. As always, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss one. We'll see you later.